On Exploring North Carolina, we've taken you down mountain streams, across Piedmont and mountain reservoirs, down lazy coastal rivers, and into our estuaries. We've also taken you by boat and canoe into canals like the one behind me. These canals allowed for commerce and agriculture, and they changed our land. In preparing this story, exploring North Carolina travel to the Great Dismal Swamp, to Carteret County, to the Albemarle Peninsula, and to Somerset Plantation. I'm at Somerset Plantation on Phelps Lake. Today on Exploring North Carolina, we're going to tell you a very important and very difficult story. It's the story of African slaves who dug canals and ditches just after the American Revolution. Our guests today are going to be distinguished scientists and historians. Dr. Stan Riggs, Dorothy Redford, and David Soselski. Stan Riggs is a celebrated coastal geologist and distinguished university professor at East Carolina University. No one knows more about the coastal ecology and geology of North Carolina than Stan Riggs. Dorothy Spruill Redford is a public historian, author, and retired director of the Somerset Plantation, a North Carolina historic site. For her groundbreaking research, Ms. Redford was awarded an honorary Doctor of Letters from East Carolina University. David Soselski is a teacher, historian, and an award-winning author of numerous books. Much of his writing has dealt with civil rights and the maritime history of North Carolina and the Southeast. I asked Stan Riggs to tell me about the land of northeastern North Carolina and southern Virginia and how Pocosin's elevated wetlands came into being. I also wanted to know about the forest that existed prior to European settlement. These Pocosin's are, are large domes of organic matter that have accumulated over the last 10 to 12,000 years. Organic matter is peat. We call it peat. So the locals here will call it blackland soils. They're produced by all the vegetation, the scrub shrubs, the grasses, and the trees that are there. If you bore a hole through this peat deposit, you'll find stumps and spruce and fir trees way down here at the bottom because that's what was here 10,000, 12,000 years ago. And these trees die and they fall over, they get buried and they're preserved in there. So this is a pile of old woody debris all the way up to what we have today. I'm sitting on top of this. What the forest that's here today is a wetlands forest, a Pocosin forest. It's the big, because it's so remote in the middle here, we end up with these incredible trees that, that the colonists found when they came into these areas. They discovered these trees like this. Well, this is a common tree back then, the cypress, which uh, these are enormous cypress, uh, Atlantic white cedars, the pond pine that were all part of this, the bay trees uh, that were part of this Pocosin complex. I asked David Soselski and Dorothy Redford to tell us why canals were critically important to a young state and nation. I also asked who made the canals possible. So for a, a century after the revolution, uh, canals were built to be the major arteries of transportation in North Carolina for trade, travel, communication. They were built to drain swamplands so that lands could be farmed uh, commercially, but also to reach uh, forest lands so they could be timbered. Um, they were uh, cut simply so that you could go see your neighbors and communicate with each other of that sort. Um, at that time, getting around by water on the North Carolina coast and in eastern North Carolina was more common than getting on a horse and going someplace. Everybody had a boat. So building canals and ditches was a way both 
for allowing you know, ships, but it was also a, a, a way for even a, the common man and woman to get around. And there were some enormous projects. The Dismal Swamp Canal, 22 miles north to south above Albemarle Sound, connected the Chesapeake Bay and the Albemarle Sound. It meant that ships uh, no longer had to travel along the Outer Banks to come into North Carolina ports. They could simply come through, through the canal and reach Albemarle Sound and then Pamlico Sound. Once they did that, there was another canal built so that uh, the canal that I grew up next to, the Clubfoot Creek and Harlow Creek Canal, was a smaller four or four and a half mile long canal that connected the Noose River estuary with uh, the Newport River and then Beaufort and Old Topsail Inlet, which was the state's largest deep water harbor at that time. Other canals were built to drain hundreds of thousands of acres of swampland around Lake Mesquite, the open grounds here, up by the Alligator River and, and Lake Phelps. These were, er these were some of the largest swamplands in America. And uh, during those years, they were drained so that they could be inhabitable, so they could be worked for agriculture, timbering. Canals really became the lifeblood of the economy in eastern North Carolina. This land was um, changed. Um, it was made usable for commerce, for um, travel, for transportation, because enslaved laborers dug it, dug, dug, dug those canals, um, cleared the area of woods and, and provided for fields, cultivated fields. Exploring North Carolina left Elizabeth City and drove north along Highway 17, which borders the Great Dismal Swamp Canal and was dug in the early years of the 1800s. It was an enormously ambitious project, supported by leaders like George Washington, that connected the waters of the Chesapeake Bay with the Albemarle Sound. We also went to the Clubfoot Creek, Harlow Creek Canal, which passes east of the Cherry Point Marine Air Station and connects the Noose River to waters behind Moorhead City and Beaufort. As Dorothy Redford stated, these projects were started by and originally dug by enslaved African people. In a land of water and dense vegetation, enslaved people performed extraordinary tasks. Just how difficult was the job of digging these canals? That job of digging that canal right there would have been a job from hell. It, was a, it would have been the worst job in the world. It's a job that I would never, ever want. It's a job that was incredibly tasking uh, from a very physical point of view. It wasn't just shovels and axes. It, we had stumps in there that come from trees like this, this size stumps. We had vegetation around the banks that were this size. And how do you do that when you have simple tools? Well, you have to have a pretty strong back and a lot of people. And it's, it's just every step of the way was pulling out stumps, pulling out logs, muck, mosquitoes everywhere, animals, snakes, everything that lives in this system is, is there and it, the heat. You can imagine being down out of the wind in this ditch digging in stuff that didn't want to be dug. The African-American slaves who worked on the water often had a kind of freedom, uh, a, a kind of mobility, a, a, a chance to, to see the world and, and even to find like precious moments on their own that other enslaved laborers couldn't imagine. The slaves who built canals, it was just the opposite. You know, canal building was the nightmare of slave life. It was of it was canal digging was was the nightmare of maritime life. Um, 
the worst conditions, the shortest, you know, they'd have the shortest lives, the most loneliness, the least hope. Occasionally, canal building companies tried to build canals in North Carolina without enslaved workers. It never worked, not in a single case. There's no other way to say it, but the kind of brutality it took to make people work in those conditions was too harsh. It is very easy to enjoy the beauty and history of Eastern North Carolina, but it is difficult and troubling for each of us to acknowledge an institution of injustice that is also part of our past. I'm in the beautiful town of Edenton, North Carolina on the Albemarle Sound. Edenton is probably best known because it was North Carolina's first capital, beginning in 1722 and lasting for a few decades thereafter. But what I'm most interested in is a ship, the Camden, which sailed into these waters in 1786. On board were 80 Africans who would dig in the following years North Carolina's first significant canal. No one knows this story better than David Soselsky and Dorothy Redford. One of the most moving episodes that I came across when I was doing my research on slaves and canal building was the arrival of the brig Camden, or the ship Camden, at uh, Edenton in 1786. Um, that was an unusual event. It, uh, it wasn't unusual for, for enslaved people to show up on North Carolina waters, but the Camden had come directly from West Africa. And because our North Carolina's ports were generally shallow and, and not as navigable as ports in especially Charleston and Norfolk, most of the West African slave trade here didn't come directly from Africa. It, it came uh, via the West Indies, uh, Africa, then the West Indies, then here, or that same kind of thing uh, to like Charleston or, or Norfolk. But the brig was, bring, was bringing right off the boat West Africans to Edenton. And, and the very first place they were sent uh, was this incredibly remote swamp that surrounded Lake Phelps uh, in the eastern part of Washington County. At that time, it was one of the, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of acres of uh, Pocosin Swamp. And they had been brought by a uh, large planter named Josiah Collins and his company, which was called the Lake Company. And they were very intentionally put to work on a canal building project that was essential for turning that land, that swamp, into agricultural land. And they dug a canal that stretched all the way from Lake Phelps to the Scuppernong River, which is this lovely blackwater creek that winds its way up toward Albemarle Sound. And in a way it was, uh, you know, they couldn't speak any English. They had no family to be um, irate or upset by the conditions in the canal in the canal digging camps. It, it sounds horrible, but, but basically it was also a bit of a lesson. The idea was that whatever might happen in the rest of their lives, you know, welcome to America. And, and many of them would later become field hands and blacksmiths and maybe boatmen, who knows. But the first lesson is that things can be worse because they've seen it. The plan of the Lake Company was to develop the land. Um, and in fact, they decided that the only way they could do it was with a substantial labor force. The only way to get a substantial labor force, as they saw it, was to go to Africa. Competitive bidding in slave markets would have cost them a fortune. They acquired and actually owned the Camden 
and a sister ship, the Alliance. They loaded it with items to sell, sent it to Boston, sold items that gave them the cash to go to Africa, and then sent the Camden directly to the coast of West Africa. And it came back with a large number of people um, because simply because it was less expensive, more cost effective to go to Africa and get people than it would have been to try to buy 20, 30 people here, two people there uh, within the continental United States. The canal is six miles long. This is the first canal dug, six miles long, 20 feet wide, six to 12 feet deep. And it took two years to dig. After the arrival of the Lake Company ship Camden in Edenton in 1786, the African men were taken in small boats across the Albemarle Sound. Exploring North Carolina took the same route. The men would have entered Bulls Bay, where they would have seen the coffee-colored black waters of the Scuppernon River and the knees of mighty cypress trees near today's Columbia, North Carolina. They would have proceeded along the Scuppernon to a point near the present-day town of Cresswell before entering the six-mile stretch of impenetrable wilderness through which they dug the canal. Knowing the history of the Somerset Canal, the Great Dismal Swamp Canal, and others, how should we view these projects and honor the people who built them? I asked Dorothy Redford to share her thoughts. First of all, we really need to stop using the generic term slaves because it really does render invisible the individual families, the complexities of their lives, um, their struggles. They were men, women, and children, and they were enslaved. Um, beyond that, planters maintained incredible records. Um, they paid taxes every year on enslaved people were like cattle. You paid in taxes on the number of cattle you owned and on the number of people you owned. So that there, is, there are voluminous records um, that you do have to dig a little for. But if you want to understand, if you want to uh, explore the complexity of uh, the lives of people who were enslaved, records are there. I asked Dorothy Redford about her journey toward understanding the history of her ancestors at Somerset Plantation, and I wanted to know about her first visit. When I arrived here 30 years ago, I had a bill of sale in hand, so I knew my ancestors were transferred to Somerset Place, and I arrived expecting to some kind of validation that I wasn't the only one who knew that. When I arrived, I got the standard industry-wide he tour. He built the land, he cultivated the fields, um, he built the house, he married and had six children. The Civil War was, outcome of the Civil War was very disappointing and he died broken, broken hearted. Even the teen tour guide who was giving us the tour of the planter's home, that's the only building that was open. Um, called an enslaved woman who worked in, in the house the hired girl. How it felt to feel invisible, that line from the invisible man, I'm invisible, understand, because people refuse to see me. So that my history, the history of my ancestors, the history of an important piece of America was invisible simply because people choose, chose not to see it. As fate would have it, Dorothy Redford's passion for history and the truth of her past led her to the job as director of Somerset Plantation. It was through Dorothy that the history of Somerset included visibility for the people who had worked there for many generations.
Since before I left, we reconstructed buildings in the enslaved community. Um, they're authentically reconstructed with archaeology, with, in fact, we just the hand of God, we had photographic evidence the buildings were standing in the 1920s um, so that we could reconstruct those buildings. And in reconstructing those buildings, we ensured that you could never again ignore. The option of ignoring the enslaved community was gone. Ironically, the canals that had served as prisons for countless enslaved laborers would also become a highway to freedom for many. In North Carolina, the Underground Railroad to the north was often a maritime road. David Soselski knows the story as well as anyone. To me, one of the most exciting stories about you know, studying maritime life and, and slavery in North Carolina is that the Underground Railroad was really built by the people, by the African-American people and some of their white allies. These people who worked on the water, they're the ones who traveled. They traveled up and down rivers, these African-American slaves, and they, they crewed ships that visited our ports, and they were pilots that brought ships in and, you know, through inlets at Ocracoke and down at the Cape Fear. So if you were a African-American man, woman, or child who dreamed of getting to freedom, very rarely would you think about traveling this kind of mythical, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, 10 miles a day north over land, hiding at night in haystacks, these sort of popular images. What you wanted to do was to find an African-American waterman that could get you to a port, and then you wanted to find African-American maritime people there that could find a place to hide you on a vessel. So the Underground Railroad in North Carolina was, uh, certainly the eastern part of North Carolina, was largely a maritime underground railroad. And the idea was that you had to make two or three crucial and very dangerous uh, steps off the plantation, down a river, find a port, New Bern, Edenton, Plymouth, wherever, and then get on a vessel headed to Philadelphia or uh, Boston or New York City. Working in the canals, the Great Dismal, Somerset, and the Clubfoot Harlow Canal was horrific work, but it was those canals that led to bigger bodies of water and freedom. Along with that came water as a symbol of freedom. Frederick Douglass said it himself when he was growing up in Baltimore and he was a ship's caulker. He said he would look out on the water and see those ships with their sails and it, 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 they looked so beautiful and he would see the sea. And to him, that ship was freedom. And, and that's the way that African-American slaves looked at the water here too. The water could, in a, at a canal digging camp could obviously be a symbol of the worst in life. But for most African-Americans, the water was a, was a symbol of freedom. Dorothy Redford and David Zaselski have helped us to understand this important part of our state and national history through their books, David Zaselski's Waterman's Song and Dorothy Redford's Somerset Homecoming. Dorothy has also made it possible for several thousand men and women to reconnect to their past and that of their ancestors at several homecoming events at Somerset Plantation. Opening up these chapters of our history and giving visibility to all North Carolinians is important to each of us. I would like for it to be viewed as normal, as American history, as history that is inclusive, that as all history should be inclusive. As we travel along or across the great canals of Eastern North Carolina, we hope you will appreciate the rich history of all the people who built them.
and we learned this while exploring North Carolina. Exploring North Carolina is made possible by the financial support of